Hello and welcome to episode 104 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician, Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. In this episode, I am joined by the award-winning composer, band leader, trumpet player, one of the most sought-after arrangers in the world right now, Guy Barker, MBE. The late great Anthony Minchella once said of Guy, he is that rare thing, a brilliant soloist, a born leader, and a generous accompanist. He can play so your heart breaks or your head swivels. Guy has played with so many absolute legends, as you'll hear, including Paul Weller during the Star Council years. As an honorary councillor, he played trumpet on singles Money Go Round and The Lodgers, and was part of the live band for Showbiz. He played on the Orange album and more. This is a really very special chat with a man who has some wonderful stories and memories. Let's get into it. Guy Barker, thanks for joining me. You're very welcome. This looks like a place where magic happens, right? Is this where you do all your work, where you're thinking, you're composing? Yes, yes. so you've got the vinyl collection there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of records, folks. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's loads on the other side as well. I'm a real vinyl geek, you know. You know, they've got these new, this thing where they have they get the original master tapes and remaster them onto vinyl. And, and the word, even the word digital, it has an exclusion zone of about 100 miles, you know, and everything's audio file and everything's analog and as a result it sounds oh like they're in the room with you it's beautiful so i'm doing that and funnily enough uh there's something i've been searching for they're all new so they're new and clean but there are recordings from the 50s particularly in the 60s you go on youtube and there's a whole army of these people with their youtube channels all obsessed with this record collecting thing and it's a fascinating thing because what's interesting about them is They love the quality of the sound and the quality of the music. And a lot of these people, it doesn't matter what the music is. They collect, you know, they've got Led Zeppelin, John Coltrane, Louis Armstrong, Ravel. They're just obsessed with great music played by great musicians in any genre. And it's you don't often meet people like that. There's everybody has a slant. You know, there's lots of very open minded people. But, you know, you go to their place and you, you look and they've got every Beatles album, every rock and roll album, but they've still got Miles Davis kind of blue because you have to have that, you know. <laughs> and then you've got people who've got, you know, all of that, all of it's all Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillis, and they've got Revolver because, you know, they think it's. <laughs> You know, there's, but these, it's an interesting uh, group of people. But I just got a 1965 pressing of Stan Tracy's Under Milkwood Suite, and Stan obviously was some of their work with for years. And to actually have that copy, because the tapes got destroyed. Right. Um, But I found that. But then I have here is a whiteboard, which looks, doesn't look so busy at the moment, but I write down everything that I'm working on. Like if I'm doing one of the jazz voice concerts, I've got all the, the list of everything, the artist. And then basically, as anal as it sounds, I write the arrangement. When I've got a beginning, middle and an end, and it's very close, but not, I I give it a tick. So I know. (laughs) Oh, so satisfying, right? (laughs) Yeah. But then, no, but that's not the best. The best bit is when I, I go back and you check every note and you check every dynamic and you go through everything and you say, yes, this is it. You send it to the copyist who does all the preparation and separate. It gets two ticks then. <laughs> then that's that. Then, you know, when, when I walk in here and all you can see is a load of names of things and there's two ticks that you just, I let it rest there for a couple of days before I wipe it off. <laughs> it's, <laughs> pathetic. Over again. it's pathetic. But, you know, <laughs> it lets me know where I am because it's kind of never ending. And I, I feel very fortunate, but ne- I would say everything I do is something I would lo- I love. And if somebody said to me, there's no money, I'd still do it. I get to work with some wonderful people. So, but I'm incredibly grateful for getting away for <laughs> getting away with it for as long as I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say that. I mean, obviously, in preparation for this chat, um, I do my research and we're talking over 400 credits on singles, albums, performances, arrangements, conducting. And there are a number of things. I mean, let me mention some of the artists, folks. So, we're talking like Frank Sinatra, Georgie Fame, Quincy Jones, Elvis Costello. This is a long list. Peter Gabriel, 
George Michael, Phil Collins, The Blow Monkeys, Block Party, Van Morrison, Jules Holland, Westlife, Grace Jones, and Sting. It was going so well, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. And of course, the Style Council. Yeah. And that's not and even, then, I mean, that's, that's, that's none of it, really, in terms of. None of the style. jazz guys are in there. Yeah. It's Apart from mental. Quincy. I mean, the, you know, Gil Evans and Ornette Coleman and, and all those people, Joe Henderson, Nat Adley, um, oh, which reminds me, I'll throw a story in here because. I think it's it's lovely because it, it accounts to some of the things you said. When I had a particular birthday, I which my birthday is on Boxing Day, and I'm, I wanted to go somewhere warm with my then girlfriend, and we went to Miami. And when I arrived in Miami at the airport, um, this was a while ago, and the. When I stood by the immigration guy, I could almost see the front of this big computer screen. I was sort of at the side. And he was quite a burly guy, a bit over serious, you know, uh, with his badge shining away. He looked at (laughs) this thing and the first thing he said to me was, uh, hello, Mr. Barker. So uh, are you working while you're here? I said, no, no, I'm on holiday. I'm on vacation. If you look, you can see my birthday. It's um, he said, yeah, I can see. I can see. OK. Yeah. He said, so you're not working? I said, no, I'm not. He said, but you have worked here. I said, yeah, but I've always had a work permit for that. He said, yeah, OK. And he said, uh, what do you do? I said, I'm a musician. He said, I know. I know. And I'm looking. He's got everything on there. He's got the names of my parents. And everything, you know. <laughs> and he said, so you're a musician. So um, might you have worked for anybody that I may have heard of? And I looked at him and it was like. It was like a duel, you know. He <laughs> stared at me. I stared at him. It was like gun sh- thing at the OK Corral, you know, gun, whatever. And I looked at him and he said, yeah, you worked for anything I may know, everybody may know. And I thought, I looked at him and looked at his age and thought, OK, here we go. I said, yeah, yeah. I, like, you know, I worked with Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Mel Torme, Lena Horne. And there was this pause. And then he looked at me and he said, you ever worked for anybody who's alive? <laughs> <laughs> I was cracking up and he just looked at me and he said, get in. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. I mean, I guess the thing is also, it's a bit like we were, you were talking about the vinyl collection, all genres, really, but you're not kind of selective in terms of no. the types of music, which is great, right? I love that. Yeah. I've always been extremely open-minded. I've had a go at everything and there's certain things that I've gone, you know what? I can't really do that because like, there are plenty of people in this business who go, yeah, yeah, I need the work. You know, I'll do that. You know, I went through a bit where I, I wanted to go back to my class classical roots. I studied classical music. I had the chance to play with this wonderful classical brass ensemble and I did everything you could. I got a piccolo trumpet and a C trumpet and I practiced and practiced and did it. And I worked with them on a few tours, but you know, in the end, I, you, I just had to own up. I said, I, this isn't what I do. There are people who are better at this than me. And I had to, and I sold my piccolo trumpet and that was a happy day for me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> all, that, all that agony, you know, but you know, yeah, I've always been pretty open-minded, but I I guess, really, if you were to ask me what I listen to most of the time, it's probably jazz and classical music and some rock as well. But it varies, you know. For me, every corner you turn, there's another surprise. Love it. Well, that seems to me, from everything I've heard about Paul on this podcast and being a fan of Mr. Weller, that seems to be something that you have in common. He's, he's very much always wanted to push forward and find new ways of working and new styles of music and just digs into everything, loves everything as well, from what I can work. I know, yeah. As this is the Paul Weller Fan Podcast, we should pick up the story in terms of Mr. Weller and how you came to work together. And what was your first connection with Paul? Were you a fan of the jam? Was that something in your collection or was it straight into the Style Council? I think... I remember being in a hotel on a tour and one of the trumpet players was going to get, a, had got a call to do something with the jam and he couldn't make it. And he asked me if I'd be available to do it. And I wasn't. And so I, I checked out some of the music. I remember it was quite exciting for me. I mean, when was the jam? What years would that have been? That was eighty. Wow, no, 70s. Yeah, 77 to 82, yeah. 77. So for me, right, 77, I was 18 years old and I was with the National Youth Jazz Orchestra and I was obsessed with this music called jazz and I'd been on tour with the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. We'd been to Russia and we'd been to the States. And I think I was so locked into this and so young, I found some of the the rock music at the time, I found it quite like almost intimidating to me. Do you know what I mean? It was this, there was this aggression that I yeah. couldn't <laughs> quite fathom being in the background that I'd come up with because I'd been playing in brass bands 
orchestras, even jazz beyond, you know, as soon as we got into the darker areas and the more avant-garde, that scared me. So it was well, there was this area and it just took me that bit of time to really get into it. And I tell you when there was a key moment for me was starting to do recording sessions. And I went in to do a thing. I played on this album with this London-based funk band called High Tension. I did some sessions with them. And then I ended up working with the guys from The Light of the World. And it was very much like music of, for me, and, and what it was, was music of Black London. I loved this. I loved being part of that. And we talk about Earth, Wind and Fire and we talk about that. And at the same time, we'd also talk about John Coltrane and Thelonious Monk. And there was all this kind of thing going. But then I remember doing a session. I was on my own. And I can't remember who it was for or where it was. I think it was in the other townhouse studio. There was the one in near Shepherd's Bush and there was another one. Maybe it was more south London. And I was doing this thing and there was no music. And the, the artist was trying to explain to me what they wanted me to do. And they came out with these names and I'd never heard of them. And they were current groups. And I remember going home from that and saying, hang on a minute. If this is going to be your career and you've got the chance to go into recording studios and make money from this, he said, you can't just go home and listen to your record collection. You've got to go and start listening to all this stuff. And so that's when I started to get into all of that. And then realizing that my career was going to be, I'd, I knew that there was a strong jazz side, but I was going to be a studio musician. So being a studio musician, I had to get into all of this. And I think, and it was that point, I started to discover things like Paul's music. And then I got a call to go and play in the brass section on one of the albums. It was when they had the studio near Marble Arch. Oh, uh, yeah, Solid um, Bond, yeah. Solid Bond, yeah. There was me in the studio. I think there was a, a trumpet player called Stuart Prosser, a, a trombone player called Chris Lawrence, and there were some other guys, and there was a lovely guy called John Mealy, and he did all the brass and string charts. And he was like proper old school arranger, turn up, wrote everything out beautifully, you know, tried the things. And I just remember being in the studio with Paul and with Mick, and there was just like a really nice energy about the whole thing. And I loved the music because it really did. I hate using that word that they use crossover, you know, mm. I did, you know, or as, or as my friend, <laughs> my friend Ian Shaw said by mistake on a radio show, he said, Oh yes, I know that person. They do all that classical class over. There was this vibe where this, this music was kind of hip and modern and it, you could hear or where it drew its influences on and, and jazz and blues were in there as well as the rock and the pop. I found this music, I remember thinking it was very sophisticated. That's how it, uh, my imme immediate reaction was. And so and I remember we did a few sessions like that and I went down and I really enjoyed it. And then we went on during the 80s. We, I remember we did a, a series of concerts. We did a tour. I remember being on the road and really enjoying that. And I, at the time, I had a massive collection of Warner Brothers cartoons on video. And I... <laughs> And I used like to Bugs Bunny and all that. Yeah, and, that, and I used to put them on the band bus and make them all watch this. And I seem to remember Paul commenting that on that on one of the gigs. It's not but, very rock and roll, that is it? You no, know, it really. wasn't. It was, <laughs> well, you see, that's the thing. Most of the time, where the rock and roll actually happens isn't like rock and roll. It's, that happens with the crowd and the media, you know. Yeah, the rest <laughs> of it, you're all watching. Yeah, Daffy yeah. Duck. <laughs> I remember doing that, and I remember doing a fantastic some kind this is at Wembley Arena, which I really loved. I had a solo on one thing. I had to go down and play, and I remember that. And also, we went to Japan once. I remember we did a hit and run, and it would be 1989, I think, probably right towards the back end of the Star Council. Yeah, so um, this was Paul's like house period, and um, I mean, we're running ahead of ourselves a little bit, and I'll come back to oh, that. Okay. I think the first one is this one here. We talk about vinyl. I'm going to hold this up to you so you can see. So this is Money Go Round. This was their second single, and there you are on trumpet, we got Annie Whitehead on trombone, um, Spagos on percussion, DC Lee, obviously, Zeke Manyika on drums, um, Joe Dwarniak on bass, Mick, Paul. There you are. That was her second single. So Money Go Round was the first time. And right. I, think, 
I presume okay. that was a solid bond, but I don't know if you can remember that session. That was very. That was even before the Style Council had even officially been announced. That was recorded. Right. Okay. It doesn't say which studio it was at. No, not the single. No, no. I mean, Maybe. it would have been. It must have been solid bond. I'd have thought, but it was been. also. It would have been like a tail end of eighty two, maybe beginning of eighty okay. three. There was a time when that didn't seem so lot far away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's like nearly forty you years. Ago. That, oh, it's forty years ago, isn't it? Kind of. Pretty thing. much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Oh, God. Mandel, that, right? hell, I can remember the studio. I can remember how it looked. I remember where we set up. I can see. I can see it. I can see it. Yeah, I can see the office where Paul's dad was, and the guy who was like a tour manager whose name was Kenny Wheeler, which was because, of course, there's Ken Wheeler, the yes. famous jazz trumpet player. Well, and I Ken- always remember when they said to me, and said, oh, you'll speak to Ken Wheeler. I went, oh, really? Is Ken Wheeler on the Wow, that's amazing. I'll get to play with Ken Wheeler. And then this guy came in who wasn't the guy, but he was lovely as well. Yeah, Kenny Wheeler's been on the podcast, so he was lovely. And I went to his house. But um, when I did my research for him, again, there was loads of stuff. I was like, this can't be the same Ken Wheeler, surely. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of really inappropriate questions about his, his, his jazz career and stuff, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one person also who was in that second session, so the second session was The Lodgers, um, was the one where essentially it had been on our favourite shop and then there was this, this single release where it said, what did it say on the front? It said, a newly recorded version presented to you by public demand because they recorded it with a full band and that would have been you. And Ashley Slater was one of the oh, yes. musicians, yeah? Of course. Actually yeah. can't remember anything about this, didn't even know he was on it. He's been on the podcast. He didn't know anything. He was like, really? I don't remember playing that at all. Whereas at least you remember being in the room. <laughs> oh, no, I can, I can remember all that. I know there are certain things that have come up and you go, I don't remember that. Because by the time we hit that period, that 82, I was really busy. I mean, I was running from one studio to the next. I was working with a lot of those guys, but Chris Hunter was this fantastic saxophone player who ended up, moving to New York and he's still there. He used to call me on a Monday morning and tell me where we'd be working that week. And it was really busy. And, and at the time, um, I got myself, my first flat where I lived I was in Covent Garden. I had a little studio flat in Covent Garden. And I can't drive. I never learned to drive. I, I always, It's not true, but I do put it down to my father, who's a stuntman. And I, I used to just watch him crash cars. And, you know, <laughs> do, you, do you remember the rise and fall of Reginald Perry? Yeah, 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 yeah. You remember the opening titles? He goes along the beach, takes all his clothes off and runs into the sea. Yeah, yeah. That was my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Why did that need a stuntman? <laughs> because it was Brian Beach at six in the morning. It was bloody cold. And Leonard Roster said, guess some man. And my dad got the job. And my bless him, my dad died of cancer quite a oh, 20 years ago. But my mum, who's 94, because it was a BBC thing and that series is popular and gets shown, she, my mum still gets little repeat checks. And she'll phone me up and she says, hey, son, your dad's bum's just got me another 50 quid. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, no, so it was... It was a very, so I understand if Ashley says, oh, you know, I can't, there are bits that just run into each other, but there are bits that always stand out, you know, yeah, yeah. for certain things. But all those sessions at Solid Bond and working with Paul and Mick and John Mealing in particular, he was, he was such a lovely man and so easy to work with. And yeah, and I remember, sta- now I remember Annie being there. Yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all back. It all comes back. back. I can remember yeah. how you get in. I know exactly. If, you, <laughs> if I was, if you were say, say to me, take me to Solid Bomb, I could do it right now. <laughs> Brilliant, I love it. I mean, the thing is with the Style Council, that music couldn't be any further removed from the jam. Where you've got echoes of jazz and blues and everything else that he's, he's taking from at that time. One thing you used, know, which I forgot to say, was now because of the jam, because it was regarded as punk, that was the reason why it scared me. Initially, because I remember living at my mum and dad's, I was, I don't know, late teens, and I got a phone call from this guy. I can't remember his name now. He was a trumpet player and he had a big moustache. And he said, Hello, guys, blah, blah, blah. He says, I've been working with this band. Was it the Saints? Was that a punk okay. band? Uh, or someone like that? Or he said, uh, They got some gigs and um, I'm not able to do it. And I go, oh, oh, right, okay. And but I'm 19, I'm 18, you know. And yeah, he said, uh, it's a bit loud and a bit raucous, but I'm sure you, you'll be all right. I said, yeah, okay, what are the dates? And <laughs> I sort of wrote them down and I said, yeah. And we were just about to say goodbye. He says, oh, guy, he said, you don't mind being spat on, do you? <laughs> and I just went, mom. <laughs> And I put the phone down. I said, I don't think I can join in. So there you go. 
there was my fear <laughs> as a young boy. So I loved working with the Style Council. <laughs> we oh, didn't have any spitting or anything. Now I know there was an awful lot of gobbling with the Style Council. That's so funny. <laughs> my goodness me, that's brilliant. Um, yeah. You mentioned the live shows. So this was the first ones were a, a few nights at Wembley Arena, which had been captured on film for the showbiz yeah. film. And the Style Council is the biggest setup really for the Style Council, where they have this huge big string section. We've got Kamel yeah. Hines, who's been on the podcast, who, who's on bass, Billy sure. Chapman on sound as well John Meeling is conducting ah oh, brilliant so, so the, the whole thing's there on the stage what can you remember because this is just this is just before your birthday so it's just pre-Christmas wasn't it <laughs> yeah exactly. I just, no I just remember it being a big gig and I remember the setup and having John there conducting the strings even though we were on the other side of the stage you know he gave me a great feeling of security and also at that time I mean after that, you know, when I got more into playing lots of jazz and I mean, I always did. But when I had, you know, Clark Tracy's quintet and Stan Tracy and all that stuff and playing bebop. But in the studio, a lot of those times I had to play a, like a lead player and play a lot of high notes. And I always remember there was a great consistency with We'd done a lot of rehearsals with the Star Council. You play that thing and suddenly things slot into place very easily. I just remember feeling quite strong on the gigs and and I remember playing quite a few of the high notes and I remember walking down to play a, the solo. It was just like an immense occasion. And there's like, I don't know how many thousand people. It was at Wembley Arena, so that's six or 7,000, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I loved it. <laughs> you know, Man. I do remember, again, it's all coming back now. I can see it. I can see where, because where we were so high up at the back, you know, and you could, you could see the Paul and, and, and Mick and DC Lee down there, you know. It was great. It was good fun. And, and it was the other thing was to get that kind of reaction, you know, mm-hmm. to be in a situation where you've got, obviously after that, there were a few other situations that I played in where I saw that kind of thing, you know. I mean, like when we were doing the Sinatra tour, we played to 25,000 people every night. And, uh, you know, there's nothing quite like the roar of a, that a crowd makes, you know, and it's quite overwhelming. That was early days for me for those kind of things. Brilliant. There's one thing around that time as well where there's a little Weller connection, which is the film Absolute Beginners. 1986, the film Absolute Beginners, based on the book, which is one of Paul's you know, favourite books, famously. And the Star Council actually recorded a song for it, Have, it, Have You Ever Had It Blue, which Paul played on his most recent tour as well. But am I right in thinking you were in the film? Right? No, no, I'm not in the film. I played on the soundtrack. Oh, quite okay. a lot. Yeah. I played on, I remember one thing we did at Townhouse Studios, which was a Mingus piece, but I played on the Gil Evans stuff because I'd, I'd met and worked with Gil Evans early, like 1981, and I played with him in New York and he came over and we and he got this band and Martin Drover was playing trumpet, Henry Lowther, myself. We did that at Westside Studios, that studio near the Westway. And... I remember Don Weller being there and Gil Evans was a fan of Don Weller. He really liked it. I remember him saying to me, he said, the reason why I like Don Weller when he plays is his sound. He says, because he plays from his stomach, you know, <laughs> and he does, you know, that sound was great. I remember there was one moment where Gil wasn't happy with the sound of something. He wanted it to be bigger. And he had a chat with the, the production people and they wanted they said, okay, well, it's Gil Evans, yeah, well, whatever you want. He came out and he said, are the rules here the state, same as they are in the States? He said, because if you overdub, if you double track, you know, basically you're now becoming two musicians. So there's a rule that at the time, which was that you can't do that because you're, you could have booked somebody else. Right, somebody so you're else taking, you're taking somebody else's work away from Yeah, you, yeah. Right? The deal was if you did double track, you didn't just get paid double, you got 125%. So you got time and a quarter again. And so we said, what do you mean, Gil? He said, well, if I ask you to double track this, he said, do you get twice as much money? And we said, well, no, in actual fact, we get 125%. He said, great, that's good. We go, and so he went in and he said, we're going to double track everything. <laughs> and you could see these guys going, oh, Christ, because they couldn't not. It's Gil Evans. And Gil was like... <laughs> <laughs> Thumbs up, brilliant. <laughs> and also at this time, films would be made and they, they would form the name of a company, whatever the name of the film was. 
So let's say it was ABC Blues is the name of the film. So it's ABC Productions. So what would happen was they'd make the film and then not just a few rogues. You know, this wasn't. You know, <laughs> but then, then the company would disband. So they'd, they'd be gone, and the last thing to go on the film was music. So there were a few cases where suddenly there was like there was no, nobody was paid, and then you try and to when the company doesn't exist anymore, it's gone. It's <laughs> oh over. wow! You know? So that so the so the, the there was a deal made because there were a couple of bad eggs that spoiled it for everybody, of course, which is usually the case, you know. It wasn't done in a heavy, vindictive way, but, you know. So the deal was whenever you finished a recording session, you'd sign your invoice and the fixer had to pay you in cash. So we ended up being at Westside Studios doing this film and we double-tracked everything because of Gil and we were there a few days and I remember the fixer coming into the studio and there was a table tennis table outside in the entrance and she sat there and there was just piles of money (laughs) all over the place and I remember this we recorded it in late December and I always remember Don Willard picking up all his cash and he looked at us he says it's going to be a good Christmas (laughs) (laughs) So, but of course, it was the eighties, and everybody thought they were rich. Didn't they? <laughs> but they weren't. <laughs> and, um, and that's so funny. What a great story! Of course, yeah, Gil Evans worked with the Star Council on that track that we're talking about, which obviously ties in with that whole album, that whole film. That makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. Um, we should also talk about this. I don't know if this is one in your collection, the Orange album. Which one's this? So this is the Star Council Cost of Loving. You wouldn't know because it's, it's oh, Cost of Loving. Yes, no, yeah. I know that title. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's on the it's on the cover. Then Paul famously it, it was his version of the White Album. So bright orange. Polydor hated it, obviously. Um, but you're there on a couple of tracks. So Fairy Tales is one of them, which was mixed right. by Curtis Mayfield, which is nuts. Right? No, I remember that being. T- I remember being told that. Yeah, I don't think. I don't think he was in the studio. And then there's uh, Walking the Night is the other track. So we'll talk about yeah. these. Um, so Fairy Tales is, I mean, Ashley Slater's on that on trombone, like I say, he's been on the podcast, but uh, Roddy Lorimer was on that session with Oh, of course. Well, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This I remember really cool. Roddy. Yeah. Um, and you're on trumpet. And then the other one was um, John Valentine on backing vocals on Walking the Night as well. And I think there was the introduction of flugelhorn on that. I don't know if that's you playing that, was it? Possibly. Yeah, I used to get called to do a lot of the flugelhorn stuff. Like, do you remember the... Matt Bianco's song "More Than I Can Bear." Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. That's that's me, flugelhorn. <laughs> but all at that time, there were loads of things like that. Like I played solos on loads of things, like you know, ooh, sometimes the um, uh, erasure, erasure. Da, yeah. da, 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 that's me. I remember doing that. I think you're on I one remember, of my favourite songs of all time as well, which is "Swing Out Sister Breakout." I love that. I am, but the funny thing is. The actual brass section session I wasn't on, but I got called in to do the 12 inch single and I had to double what they played and solo all over it. So, but the, the song that I played a solo on was called Surrender. Ah, oh, I love that. Yeah, they were great. Although on Wikipedia, it says that John Thurkle played on that, who worked with them a lot, was a fantastic uh, trumpet player, but he didn't play that solo, although he must have done on gigs. And he's a friend and he was fantastic. But the, I remember I was coming back from somewhere abroad and I landed at Heathrow and went straight to Master Rock Studios to do that thing. Got out and they said, OK, this is it. This is this solo we want you to go. We want you to play. This is the section. And I remember on the first take going, da, 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 I played this, I played the two, there's, if you imagine there's four phrases, I played the first three and they went, that was it, except the ending. I said, wow, I said, I'm on it today. I'm on it today. This is great. So we ran it and it took like an hour and a half for me to get this last phrase. <laughs> Every time I did it, it wasn't right. But I got those the, the, the that opening, you know, you can hear it, surrender. If you listen to that, you know, all those opening phrases, Got it all like that. And then it was a nightmare to try and get the ending. There was one other one, the connection, I think, with Paul as well, that I was going to talk to you about before we get on to that kind of the end of the Style Council, um, which obviously you're going to have to take the blame for. Um, but it was, a, <laughs> it was a connection with one of the other honorary councillors, Junior, who would have played on those Christmas gigs. But didn't you play on like Mama Used to Mama Say? Mama Used to Say, absolutely. Oh, love it. And I loved that. And I remember Chris Hunter and I played on... And that mama used to say, and I'm trying to think, I think we may have done, I can't remember the studio. I don't think it was at Good Earth. 
But wherever we played it, it was a really happy session. And working with Junior was just a joy, you know, when we subsequently played on some other stuff. And I managed to hook up again by getting on one of the concerts I do at the I did at the Barbican that opened the London Jazz Festival. And I managed to do an orchestral arrangement of Mummy Used to Say. And we did something together and I did a version for Big Band as well. But he was great. But I remember... It was very typical of that era because we we finished Mummy Used to Say and then Chris and I ran off to do this other session. And I can't remember what the other job was, but it was also quite a hip song. And both songs got into the charts and they were very close to each other (laughs) going up the charts. Brilliant. And on top of the pops, you generally had to hire the people that were playing on the album to to mine to the track. But you used to supposedly re-record it the day before, but a lot of the time it, the tapes would get swapped. It was just a way of making sure that pe- musicians got paid, I mm. guess. In that, well, it was. That was what it was there for. And I remember there was this scene where both of these record companies, you know, were there, but we couldn't be seen to be playing on both <laughs> songs. So there was this hoo-ha that went on about who got the brass sections to play on the album, who actually were playing and who got two others, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. But I'm it pretty. was like that. There was just so much going on in, in that. Like, you know, there's there's lots going on now, but I think what the difference was was nearly all the songs, you know, had brass sections and had lots and lots of real instruments and not so much electronic because it mm. just wasn't really there. Junior's <laughs> a wonderful man, yeah. Well, it's lovely. And I think, yeah, you've worked together quite a bit since as well, which is great. There's a couple of other things, actually, connections with the Style Council. So one, this is from Mr. Cool's Dream, which is the ultimate Style Council book, ultimately. So let's see if you remember this. This is July 26th, 1986. He says, a largely unknown charity venture results in many musicians attending Psalm Studios, the location of the Band Aid recording, under the banner of People in Progress. The purpose is to record a track, This Is My Song. Paul and Dee would lend their support, an honorary counsellor, Guy Barker would play trumpet. Do you remember anything about that? No, no. That's interesting. I, I wish I knew more, but you know, again, there were loads of things going yeah. on, but it sounds like a great thing to be involved with. At Psalm Studios. Yeah, which is where Band Aid was recorded. I, I of course, yeah. yeah. And yeah. also lots of other stuff. I mean, I, I think I even did, a, I, I did some tracks for Kylie there as well. There was but, loads of stuff there. I think we did, I did, we did Slave to the Rhythm there. Oh, wow. Trevor, Trevor Horn's place, wasn't it? Yeah, there was lots going on there. Well, I'd we like do, to hear it. Well, we'll do some more digging on that. The other thing is, where is it? Up here. Paul Weller fans, Style Council fans, you can actually hear Guy, um, as well as see him on the Showbiz video and, and obviously on that's on YouTube these days. But there is a Style Council in Concert DVD, which features you on a few of the tracks because this was recorded live. So I think you're on, what's the tracks now? Stones Throw Away. And then it's, like right. a, and it's like a soul deep strength of your nation medley, then move on up and down by the same. And and so you're on there. You're on that CD. It's not widely known this, but it was one that was kind of put together. When would it have been? Like early 90s, maybe? Can you I'll, still get that? I don't know. I'll get you a copy. I'll sort you out. Well, I'd love to say, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. I'll sort you out. Um, right. So end of the Style Council. So you got to go to Japan and this was Paul Weller's house period, right? So this was kind of quite a departure. I remember everything about Japan because I'd... Too much personal stuff. I, we did it. Really, it was a hit and run. I think we flew on the Monday, arrived on the Tuesday. Um, we had Tuesday night off, and then we. I think we did a concert in Tokyo on the Wednesday. We did Yokohama or somewhere Thursday or somewhere else on the Friday, and flew back straight away. It was in three gigs out. And Omar, I remember. I remember that being really quite jolly. I remember us all having a laugh. I remember one particular night in a, in a hotel bar where everybody was crying with laughter over something, some antics that a couple of the guys had got up to. It was when they you know, those ridiculous things that came out um, where it was a flower and you turned on it, reacted to music. Yeah, the dancing yeah, nobody flower. Nobody knew yeah. about them. Yeah, the dancing <laughs> flower had just come out in Japan, and there was also and there was also a teddy bear that you could buy that you could speak into it, you know, and it would repeat what you said. And you know, we had you know, we're putting them outside members of the band's hotel doors, knocking on the door, and when they opened, teddy bear would swear at them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of challenge, but it was great. Actually, it was it was fun. 
yeah, it was fun, but it was it was real hit and run, you know. Yeah, well, it's a great lineup because you've got Jacko Peak, who's been on the podcast, who's a lovely fella and an amazing player. But Doctor Robert was playing with the Star Council for those gigs as well from the Blow Monks. Of course, oh blimey! And Marco Nelson, who worked with Paul later on and stuff. So a few other things we have to talk about in terms of your career and Paul Weller. One was this award you got from Radio Two. So I'm trying to think what year this would have been. So this would have been... Um, it was It was when my album... It was for my album soundtrack, which would have been 1999, 98, something like that. Okay. So 1999, 2000. There was, it was the Queen Elizabeth Hall and it was a BBC Jazz Awards thing. And I remember I knew that I was going to get this award because it was like a, an individual thing, like it was best band or best album or best something anyway. And I remember being in the green room backstage and Paul was there and I said, Oh, hello. What, what are you doing here? And he says, Oh, I'm just here. You know, I said, Oh, okay. That's nice. You know, then we went on. Then when I got the award, the host, whoever the host was, I can't remember, introduced Paul and Paul said a few nice things about me and then presented me with the award. And I was like, and I said to him, I said, that was so great. And I remember we had a, a drink afterwards and we hung out for quite a while and it was just great. He's such a, I mean, he's such a great guy. And, and he said to me, he said, I remember him saying to you, this isn't good enough. He said, you should be getting a lifetime achievement award. I said, hang on a minute. I haven't lived long enough yet. <laughs> I said, don't turn me into an old man yet. And then we, we had a laugh about that. But then I, I was really knocked out. I mean, I really was. And it was a real surprise that he was there and he was there for that reason. And the producer of the show told me, I said to him afterwards, I said, that was really, that was really, that came out of nowhere. You know, I, I didn't expect to see Paul there and that was really lovely. And he said, I'll tell you something. And he told me that they'd asked him if he would present an award, you know, and apparently Paul said to them, I don't really, I'm not really into awards and stuff like that. It doesn't really, it's not really, you know, my thing. I'm not really interested, you know. And then he said, well, who's it for anyway? And the producer said, he said, it was, it's for Guy. And Paul said, I'll do it then. You know, I'm crying now. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, no, I mean, it did. It made me feel quite, you know, that was, that was a, a, a very sweet thing to do for me. You know, that's something I'll never forget. Lovely. Well, I can tell, and I can see that you are emotional. That is, <laughs> <That's good. laughs> well, I imagine there were a few tears uh, many years later, 2015, where you become member of the Order of the British Empire, the MBE in the New Year's Honours list. I know, I know. Well, that was that was the most ridiculous shock I've ever had because I this letter had arrived, you know, on Her Majesty's service, and I put it on the table just over there, and I thought it was from the tax man. I was going to say it was tax, I, It, it tax looked demand. so official. It looked, and so I ignored it. <laughs> I ignored it for a week. I was with a, a girlfriend of mine. I remember thinking and just saying, oh, fuck, I'm going to have to open this. You know? And I opened it. And it's very heavy. You know, the, the way it reads is very, and you're going, what? What? The, the prime minister, the, the queen, the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it dawned on me what it was. And I remember sitting down and all I could remember was think about was my dad, you know, my dad who was my biggest supporter, who did crazily beautiful things to guide me in music. He was an actor and a stuntman and he died way too young from cancer. He died the day after his 70th. And when one of his stuntmen friends had said you should encourage him because he's starting to sound all right on the cornet when I was 13 or 14 or something. But then I started to lose a bit of interest because, yeah, I wanted to see whatever, because it seemed a bit all consuming and I wanted to go out and play with the other kids, you know. And so my dad went to this guy and he said, what does it mean when it says trumpet in and there's in B flat? And he said, well, that's the key it's pitched in. It's not pitched in concert pitch like a piano, you know, the instruments like saxophones and, and trumpets and stuff. They're not pitched in the same key. They're fundamentals in a different place. And he said, well, what else is in that key? And he said, clarinet. My dad was a huge Benny Goodman fan. So he went and bought a clarinet, had lessons and sat it when he was doing movies. It was, he would sit in the car because, you know, they'd be kept hanging around for ages and he'd practice all the time. And he actually got to be quite good. And he came home one day with this, these books called Duets for Two B-flat Instruments. And we used to sit in the dining room and play these duets. And then an aunt of mine heard us play 
And she turned to me and she said, here, your dad's better than you now. And that did it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the competitive element, love it. Yeah. And then years later, he'd given up. And I asked him, I said, why? Because he, he, he said those were the happiest times of his, of his life with those playing those, those musical evenings in the room when I was a teenager. And, you know, and I said, why did you stop? Then he said, well, he did. He said it did what I wanted it to do. And I said, you, you put yourself through all of that just for me, you know. So so when I got that, that was the first thing I thought was, oh, my God, you know, I wish my dad could have seen that. But the, the best thing about it for me was on the day, they're wonderful to you and they look after you and, and you're you're sent away in various groups in the queue. You know, I was in a group of 10 and I was near the end and it goes on for an hour and you're in the ballroom and there's this army string orchestra up in the balcony, the minstrels gallery playing very sedate music throughout the whole thing. And when I got there at the front and it was Prince William, I went up, you know, and he pinned the thing onto me. And the first thing he said to me was, you know what, we could really do with some jazz in here right now. (laughs) (laughs) I would, yeah, I would, it made my day, you know. <laughs> was- oh, wow. Love it. Love it. There's another story I have to get you to tell, which I found whilst I was researching this, which was, I don't know if you remember this, this was 2002 and some work you'd done for the Barbican. And you'd basically, you'd written something and then you had to write an arrangement of it for a full orchestra for the, the Oh, Barbican. yeah. Sounds, sounds in black and white. Tell me about the party afterwards, because this is a brilliant story. Can you remember oh. this? <laughs> Yeah, I had to tell this story in Ireland and they put it in a paper. It wasn't actually a party afterwards. What actually happened was I did this piece, this Sounds in Black and White. It was dedicated to film noir. And the way I, I did it was, and I explained to the audience, the instruments, I explained the story of what I'm trying to tell in the, in the music. And there's an opening titles, which sounds like that. And then each character is represented by a different instrument in the jazz ensemble. And if he's no, he's not a noir character. The tenor sax was Cary Grant, but the alto sax was definitely Lauren Bacall. And the trombone was Edward G. Robinson. And we did this. And that was that. In the audience that night, there was... Um, a lady called Fiona Morris, who worked for BBC Wales, and, and she was with a team of people, and she was the one that said, when are you doing this next? We have to film it. And so I said, well, we haven't got any in the book. So they put it on at the Brecon Jazz Festival and filmed it. Also in the audience was a lady called Jude Kelly, who worked for Yorkshire Playhouse, but then ran the South Bank. And I think she was just in between that or she was yeah, something like that. Anyway, she invited me to a dinner party a few weeks later with a lot of interesting people, artistic people. And she, she liked this idea of us all just chatting and coming up with ideas. And it was, it was a really nice night. And anyway, she went over to the corner and she was on the phone. And then she called me over and she was saying, yeah, no, it, you'd really like it. You're in it, you know. <laughs> and uh, I'm going, what's she talking about? She said, yeah, no, it was a great fit. In fact, I said, I've got the composer here. Would you like to speak to him? And obviously there was a, a yes. And she handed the phone to me and she said, Guy, it's Lauren Bacall. <laughs> <laughs> I've just, and I got on the phone and I had this five minute conversation with this incredible woman. And the only thing I can remember from the conversation, because most of the time I was just (laughs) spluttering. She said, tell me about this piece. And I said, well, it's a thing called Sounds in Black and White. And and I, I wrote it for a seven piece jazz group. And you know, we played it a lot and we recorded it and, and it seemed to go down really well. And then I got invited to do it with a full orchestra, like, you know, with 65 people. And she said, that's the version I want to hear because, as I always have said, the more musicians, the better. That's the line I will never forget. <laughs> and then afterwards, I remember going into a room to the side and sitting down for 20 minutes, trying to work out what had just happened. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Hey, guys, this has been so lovely. I have to ask what's on the whiteboard. I know one thing that must be there, which is um, your annual event at the Royal Albert Hall. I mean, it's a little way off Christmas every year. I mean, you talk about a lot of musicians. What is it, like 38 people in your band now? Is that right? But, but yeah, for the Christmas gig, there's 38. When I do the jazz voice that opens the London Jazz Festival, there's 44. But I was just in Cheltenham doing the open now. I had about 75 then. You know, that kind of seems to be what I'm stuck with these days, but it's fun, you know. And as I've always said, I I think I even said it on that when Paul gave me that award. I, I think I said something like, which is true, I said, you know, music 
You sit here for hours and days and weeks and months putting all these dots on paper, you know, and that's all fine, but they kind of don't mean anything until you put them in the hands of amazing musicians and then they show you how it's supposed to go. And that's the wonderful thing because you hear their interpretation. It becomes their music. You know, I, I once had the huge opportunity, a great opportunity to work with Hermeto Pascal, the great South American composer, the guy that Miles Davis said was the best musician he'd ever met. I had to be the musical director on this and he put his scores, he, could, he, he had a translator who didn't speak English and he put the scores in my hand and I held them there and then he spoke to me and the translator said, Hermeto says... It was his music. It's now yours. You show everybody how it's supposed to go. So it's kind of, that's the thing I suppose I love about music and creative because you have an idea about how something will sound in your head. And often that comes out, but then there are things that happen that is interpretation from how they feel, you know, how it should go. And that's a really important thing that people should know about. And there's one thing I have to say. I, I saw the thing that Paul did on TV with the BBC Symphony Orchestra and Jules Buckley. And I was riveted to that. I've always known Jules is amazing and his team of writers. He has had, had a number of amazing arrangers on. And, and it was all ama amazing the way it amalgamated. But the other thing that it kind of drove home to me is what an amazing songwriter Paul is. When I go back to the 80s and you're playing away and you, you're lost in the moment and you're playing your part and, and you're, sometimes you're back there and you can hear yourself on the rhythm section and it's not until you actually sit in front of it all and take it all in that you you know and it's like when I listen to the albums because you're so concentrating in part when you finally sit down and you stand back and you think okay I was that tiny little part of it that was taking up every thinking moment on the gig for me when you sit and finally listen to it you know all of it and that like in those concerts like seeing that DVD of the concert when I was back there keeping yeah. my eye on John Meaning and all that. <laughs> it's just you look at, you, know, you strip away all of that stuff and just listen to the song. And that's when you go, oh my God, this, you know, he writes songs that could sound great with just him singing it, just with a guitar, with 85 musicians, you know, it's that, it's the, the root of it. The, the very core, the essence of, of the piece of music of him, you, you could strip away everything. And the song completely stands on its own as something great. And that doesn't happen with lots of songs, you know, lots of stuff. Yeah, sometimes people rely on all that extra stuff because wasn't that line there and that, you know, and suddenly the trombones did that, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's the thing about Paul's songs, I think. Wow. Uh, well, hey, look, man, I, I've loved every second of this. I have two final questions for you before you go. And it's been such a pleasure to spend time in your company, honestly. I feel like we could crack, crack on for another hour and still. I mean, there's so much to your career, man. Honestly, no, it's, it's amazing. So congratulations on all the work. And I look forward to whatever's next, I have to say as well. But this has been brilliant. So two final questions. You're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life. It can be <laughs> his face. It can be the jam, the style council or solo. What are you going to go with? I don't know. That's too many. That's not fair. <laughs> what was the song with the flugelhorn on it? <laughs> oh, well, the one that you played on. Yeah, yeah. What was that one? Walking the Night. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll pick that because I, it's, it's a memory for me. But there's too many. They're all great. What do you <laughs> <laughs> Some of my guests have pretended that Zoom freezes at that point. You know, the, and, and, oh, no, it's no, no. Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, but also walls come, walls come tumbling down. I mean, there's something that's amazing, you know, almost anthemic, you know. I it's not fair. <laughs> I'll say that that one and walls come tumbling down. I mean, yeah, for me, walls come, walls come tumbling down was kind of joyous. I remember feeling when when that was roaring away on a live concert, you felt good. All right. Well, I love that. I would look, and the lyrics mean as much today as they did when they were written on that one as well, right? Cool. It's, it's crazy. Um, so final question, right? So the purpose of this podcast is not least to talk to amazing people like yourself and dig into the connections with Paul and hear about your careers and stuff like that. But really, I've got to be honest, it's for me to get the interview with Paul Weller that I never managed during my radio career. If it happens, what should I ask him? Don't ask him about my cartoon collection. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, 
I would ask him that that whole thing that everybody asks and it's a bit dull, but I always like it because everybody has a slightly different answer and it's the, the process of composing a song because there's loads of answers to it. You know, it's like so-and-so and myself, we got together and we banged out these ideas. Why it's an interesting question is because you'll get an answer that will go on for even longer than I do. <laughs> <laughs> because there's so many, there's so many answers to it, and there's so many ways. And then you, you could pick out what you could, what I would do is I'd go through his catalogue and find three very different songs of his, and say, okay, here's these three. What was the process to get to where they end up? Not just the basic song, but the whole, the recording, the whole thing, the whole journey from when it appeared in your head to when it lands on wax or tape or whatever it is. So the whole process. Because what's interesting is you create a song and blah, 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 and then you get to a certain point and then you start recording it and then suddenly they go, do you know what? This could really do with a... You know, flugelhorn. Flugelhorn. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because the, and what stirred it up? Because it could be that you they start the song in its basic form. If somebody said to them, you know what? It could do with a flugelhorn. They go, no, it doesn't. No, you're kidding. No, not on this. No. But then something happens. Something happens along the way. Something changes. For example, when I compose music, I remember speaking to an author friend of mine, one that I collaborate a lot with, Rob Ryan. And I called him up one day and I said, do you know what? I said, it's, it's so frustrating. I'm writing this piece of music. I've planned it out in my head. I've even put a little graph saying, right, it must go here, go here. I said, I'm doing it. And then halfway through, it just seems to wander off somewhere else on its own, like out of my control. I said, and it's really weird because I have no objection to where it's going, but it's not what I wanted it to do. But it seems to go that way. I said, that's the thing. It must be great for you as an author because that, that never happens to you. And he said, you kidding he said, it happens all the time. I said, like, what? He said, well, he says, I'm sitting here. I'm writing a book, blah, blah, blah. I've got this character. I'm developing this character. I really like this character. I turn over the page and he gets run over by a bus. And I'm thinking, I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I think some writing is the same. The journey is, is an interesting one. I love that. I love that. And, and it's a bit like, you know, if you think about it, I don't know, the Marvel mu multiverse thing, like what would have happened to that song if you'd have gone off in the other direction? And suddenly, yeah, there were all these, somewhere in the, the multiverse, there are all these other versions of the song where you decided to make a different decision. And that character in the book didn't get run over by a, by a bus because you went with the other <laughs> option. You know, those kind of things. I love that. Somewhere in the, in the multiverse, there's all these different versions of stuff. That'd be lovely. Yeah. Hey, Guy, this has been so lovely. I really appreciate your time, man. Thanks for joining me. You're very, very welcome. Thanks once again to the very lovely Guy Barker. What a brilliant chap. And do check out my show notes for this podcast for some musical highlights from Guy, videos, and a playlist of some of our favorites too. Now, if you've enjoyed listening to the podcast, there are various ways to show your support. You can buy me a virtual coffee or get some of our exclusive official merchandise on my website, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. Just type it into Google, paulwellerfanpodcast.com. You can share a link to the podcast on your social media channels. It all helps to spread the word and get in touch on Twitter at Weller Fan Pod or on Instagram and Facebook, Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.